at a high level Web2 Social, they are extremely evil companies. They own all of our data and can use it in perpetuity for whatever purposes they please. And you imagine Facebook goes under, they have to liquidate their assets. One of those assets is all of our data and they sell it to a company which creates AI chatbots that sound like you, Justin. You know what I mean? Like that's scary. And this is like for my code, right? Like when we think about all of the IP that these communities are creating, it should be owned by them rather than assuming it's technically theirs, but we have perpetual usage rights. That's just like a very exploitative business model. All right, everybody, what's going on? This is the Other Life Podcast and I am Justin Murphy. In today's episode, we're speaking with Mark Balin. So I brought Mark on the podcast because I really like his ideas and his theoretical perspective around Web3 social businesses. There is a very interesting thing going on right now where some of the most interesting and dynamic online organizations are organizations where the lines are very blurred between who is an investor, who is a producer, who is a consumer, who is a customer. There are these new formats emerging where you can basically create a community, make the community a business, whether it's a DAO or not, whether it's crypto based or not, that part doesn't really matter. But what really matters is you can create these communities where pretty much everyone is aligned on a certain goal. You can align incentives in a really fluid and dynamic way where pretty much everyone just throws whatever value they have at the problem in a way that's fun often gamified, often friendly, often leveraging social status and internal cultures to motivate and reward people. And this is just a extraordinary space of experimentation that seems to be really thriving right now and moving really, really fast. And it's just not obvious what's even going on there, how to think about that, what exactly is happening there. And so Mark is someone who's written about this and, and has been speaking about this lately, and he's building a company called Myco. You can check them out at myco.space. And he's trying to build a system of communities that put this concept of social business at the, at the forefront. So what he wants to do is basically make it possible for you to start a social business out of the box. He wants to provide the infrastructure for that community to interact and to run its operations where the shared finances and the, the commercialization is all done for you as simply as possible out, out of the box. So right now, people are using things like Discord to do this. People are connecting you know, ERC-20 Ethereum tokens to Discord bots, which allow people to distribute value within Discord communities, but it's very clunky. It's obviously not fit to purpose. It's obviously suboptimal. And I see Mark and Maiko as one of the big efforts to disrupt this highly suboptimal kind of Discord norm that you're seeing today. Um, I think Mark is trying to build a community infrastructure for this type of new social business, often built on crypto, but not necessarily built on crypto. And so, yeah, I just like his perspective. I like what he's building. He's been working hard on this for the past year or so with a co-founder of his, and I like his idea. So I wanted to bring him on and I wanted him to share his his diagnoses and his, his theoretical perspective on the nature of community and business today. So. He's also just a cool dude. I really enjoyed talking with him. I think you're going to find a lot of insights in this podcast if you're interested in this kind of stuff. So that's all for now. Let me get out of the way and let's get on to the show. All right, Mark. So I wanted to bring you on the podcast because I'm very interested in some of your theoretical ideas around community and Web3 and what the, the near future of social media is going to look like you yourself are building an interesting project in this space. So why don't we just start with telling the audience about what you're building, what is Myco, and just give us the basics of, of how it works and, and how you see the value proposition. For sure, yeah. So uh, Myco is kind of the, the culmination of like five plus years spent building in crypto and kind of seeing the way that uh, crypto communities can um, sort of engineer abundance in thin air, out of thin air. Um, basically, when you have a group of people who all have the same goals um, and what we think of as like potential energy, um, how do you convert that into like real life action? And so um, crypto communities have figured out how to do this with tokens and incentives and things like that. And uh, Myco kind of brings all of this together and packages it up in such a way that um, anybody uh, who 
you know, people who don't care at all about crypto uh, can still do the same things. And so, you know, we let people uh, launch like social businesses online with their friends, um, build communities that they own and, you know, are owned by, um, by their members and their contributors. Um, and really not just like kind of build a new version of social media, but also build a new version of like internet native companies that hopefully will be um, quite exciting, <laughs> we think. Right. Awesome. And so, I mean, one way to understand what's going on with the crypto world right now is there's just this extraordinary mingling of work and play and friendship and business. And there are these new forms of organization where it's kind of like one individual might be a producer and an investor and a consumer all in one. And it's very, very blurry. It's very, very fuzzy. It's all moving very fast. And, and it, it's, so it's absolutely fascinating. It seems certainly very important, but it's kind of anyone's guess as to what really are the underlying dynamics. What, how is all this stuff going to shake out? And so you've thought a lot about this. You've written about this. I'm curious if you could just kind of zoom out with us for a minute and t give us your kind of mental model for how you see that. Like what, what's, what are the most important things to understand about this? Um, and then we'll kind of work through how that informed your, your building decisions and, and your own personal kind of entrepreneurial wagers, but what at a high level is, is most interesting to you or most important to see in this new dynamic? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's definitely a flipping, um, of the sort of script from this world of like, don't mix business and friendship and this view of, um, us inside the business and then everyone else on the outside and turning that into like, okay, well, what if everybody is on the inside, right? Like, what if there is no outside? What if um, you're, you're starting these businesses with your friends or, you know, people you're close with um, and, and taking advantage of kind of these like high trust relationships um, to be able to move really quickly. And I think that's probably the most compelling thing about, you know, DAOs or these kinds of like new internet native organizations is that they're able to move uh, really kind of like at lightning speed, basically as quickly as they can execute uh, because they avoid any level of like bureaucracy at a at a very like early stage. And so they can build cool products, um, produce really interesting media um, and make decisions really quickly around like money and allocating money or allocating time and resources um, and do so because, yeah, like because there's a high degree of trust. Um, because there's a high degree of like autonomy, you know, using powerful tools like crypto to be able to send really large amounts of money really easily uh, or invest in different projects. Um, and so that kind of culminates in this like hyper dynamic, really fluid model of business that um, doesn't have like large bureaucracies or um, like lots of structure oftentimes. And, it, and it's much more of like this dance with with your peers um, that is... Um, not always comfortable and, and lends itself sometimes to some difficult conversations, but uh, from what we've seen, at least um, leads oftentimes to people being able to build really, really interesting things kind of out of thin air and, and really quickly. Okay, great. And so for people listening who maybe aren't deep in this world, basically right now, all of this social business energy is mostly taking place on discord just because the the discord app has some bots it has some integrations that you can uh, link up to things like nfts and social tokens and so it's very uh, immature it's very unsophisticated but of all of the places to build communities right now it does have the most developed kind of crypto linkages and people are using it to interesting effect so what Myko is trying to do as i understand it is basically saying hey this discord thing was not made to purpose. We can do so much better to create communities that are crypto first. And you're designing Myco to do that as, as far as I understand it. And so walk us through a little bit about how you see the, the community playbook for a truly kind of community, uh, crypto first, uh, community slash social business. Like what are the best practices in your view? Like, what are the key ingredients that pretty much everyone would want to do? And in what, just tell us a little bit about like, in what order, um, what, you know, is it an NFT to raise funds and then an ERC 20 for, you know, sharing value within, is it, um, profile picks as NFTs as, you know, there's all these different possible components. What's your kind of overarching theory for the, 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 the playbook for crypto first communities? Well, so yeah, so I mean, I'll, I'll share a playbook for building these like 
digital communities, digital social clubs, whatever we want to call them. But I will caveat that this playbook will not be uh, crypto native because I do believe that um, there are ways and, it, it, you know, it's sort of like meaningful for people to try to 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 do this stuff uh, without necessarily trying to do these things like on a blockchain. Um, and so that's a kind of a big part of, of Myco is like, yeah, you don't have to be crypto native. Uh, you don't have to know how any of it works to be able to um, interact with these things to a certain degree. Um, so that's really important to us. Um, but Wait, but the plumbing the for Myco, for Myco, the plumbing is crypto, right? Or no, you can have a non-crypto social business on Myco. It's actually mostly not crypto. It's actually like technically oh, okay. crypto without the blockchain. So we use like public private huh. keys and you're signing things, but uh, so it's like cryptography, but uh, a lot of things are not, in fact, most things are not on any blockchain. You don't have to know how transaction fees work or, you know, any of the kind of complexities we wrap it all um, in an interface that makes it easy to use. And, you know, people just see like US dollars and you know, things like that. Okay, interesting. But if you do want to bring in crypto tools, like whether it be the ERC-20 or the ERC-721, whatever, you're you're building functionality to do that smoothly. I, I do understand exactly. that correctly. Yeah, okay. yeah exactly. Um, Got it. But going back okay, to your so earlier on. question, yeah, the, the, the community playbook. So, I mean, in my head, and again, this is like very rough. We're still super early. But, you know, in my head, kind of like step one is finding your core team. Right. You want to have probably north of three people. I mean, it depends on your like what you're trying to do, but you want to have at least three people. If it's just two of you, you know, things get kind of difficult if you ever have like disagreements or if you ever want to sit like resolve things. It's always just much easier with a third head in the room. Um, and so gathering that like early group of people is kind of step one. And as you're doing that, um, what will develop is a sort of set of goals or a mission. Um, and then a sort of set of values as well that like, what is, what are you trying to do? What do you, what does this group exist to, to accomplish and how do you plan on accomplishing it? What are the sort of terms by which you want to, what you want to achieve that? Um, and then from there you like start, right. And I think the best way to build any community is by like doing the thing that your community is meant to do. Um, and so whether that community is around education or producing content or just exchanging ideas, um, just like getting it started really early, even at a very small stage is kind of like the best first thing to do before launching a token or anything like that um, from in terms of like a social community or a social business. And then, um, you know, from there, then, yeah, you start to want to think about things like ownership um, or, or incentives. I think an, an incentives kind of framing it, rather than necessarily thinking about NFTs or ownership or this or that uh, is important because... Um, Ultimately, like it, it doesn't necessarily matter as long as people are incentivized. And what I mean by that is um, like a lot of blockchains, for instance, exist via incentives to their contributors, um, but those incentives are not really ownership and they don't necessarily come with voting rights. Um, some other types of organizations might prefer to have an NFT that they launch and um, reward contributions with with those. But ultimately, I think from an incentives perspective, that's kind of the goal is to like, you want to give people something that rewards them um, for having done something, for, for having contributed work or time or effort, and putting that in. Um, and then the goal ultimately is you, you start to do this, you start to do whatever it is you're doing. Um, and then hopefully as you start to, you know, make some money, whether that's by selling some NFTs, um, earning revenue, selling merch, there's like a, a infinite number of ways you can earn money on the internet these days. Um, and as you earn that money, figuring out a way to have that value flow back to those people who earn those incentives. Um, and I think some of the ways that we've seen this done in a quasi legal way is with, you know, token buybacks or different things like that. Um, at Myco, we think that that's like not the most efficient way to do it, that the easiest way to incentivize contribution is just to give people shares in a company that you're all building together, um, earn money, and then just give dividends back to those contributors. Um, and that that's kind of like the best way to close the value creation loop. Um, because I think that, and I think that's like kind of the biggest point is getting to a place where people who have contributed have started getting something back and realize that contributing at this early stage is valuable. Because I think um, you know, people have talked about sweat equity for a long time, right? In startups and things like that. But generally, their sweat equity isn't regarded as valuable or something that people want. Um, and the biggest kind of cultural mindset shift that, that crypto has introduced is that it actually being there early is the most valuable thing you can do. And contributing to early projects is the most valuable way to, or the, I guess, the most profitable way to, to 
build value for yourself um, from a personal basis. And so um, thinking about like speculating with your time or contributing to early projects as, as a speculative action, not as an investment of, of money, but as an investment of effort uh, or energy. Um, and through that lens, you know, getting people to contribute or contributing yourself, getting value created back, uh, and then reinitiating that loop again, because once you sort of see that feedback loop, you, you know, as a contributor, you think like, oh, wow, this is actually going somewhere. And this might actually be even bigger than next loop. Right. And so that's kind of how they magnify themselves. And so that's like, when I think about like these like engines for abundance, like that's kind of what I'm talking about, where you can have a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. If you can have sort of enough people there early on who can contribute, who can kind of believe in those goals and can kind of help achieve them even at a small, in a small way early on. Okay. Fascinating. Yeah, totally. So is it, am I hearing this correctly that it was, it's kind of a design decision on the part of Myco that you're actually not super interested necessarily in the tokenization stuff, but actually the more traditional like shares in an LLC is more how you think about it. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, we have a sort of custom LLC structure design that allows us to, um, you know, have shares be diluting constantly and to, and in particular for them to be rewarded to contribute to contributors, excuse me, um, in a way that reflects a lot of the ways that tokens are rewarded to people in the crypto space um, with like really sort of efficient microtransactions and a lot of different ways that tokens are being distributed. Um, but ultimately, they definitely don't need to be assets on a blockchain for that to be the case. Um, and if you're doing things within a legal wrapper, um, which is kind of what we encourage, um, then at that point, it actually is sort of more expensive and just like unnecessary to to take that final step and put things on a blockchain. It's it's not needed. Right. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. So, okay, great. So are there any other interesting kind of design decisions that Myco had to make that are interesting opinionated, opinionated, you know, uh, theses on 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 what the ideal kind of social business community looks like. What else should we know about how it works that's important or interesting? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the other elements that we encoded, um, and this is another thing that we sort of learned from being in the sort of communities DAO space over a number of years and seeing people try uh, to to build these communities with very like flat hierarchies. Um, is sort of recognizing from like an organizational development perspective, like when is it beneficial to do that? And when is it beneficial to have like individuals who are sort of on the hook for particular decisions or who are responsible for, for particular actions? And this is something in my code, you know, we give kind of like a lot of power to the creators of these codes um, and encourage them ultimately to give that power away to their contributors, which is ultimately the goal of even starting one of these things is to bring in collaborators. Um, but ultimately, like the sort of initial powers rest with them. And um, this kind of reflects the way that we see early communities needing to grow and and honestly growing is that they start with a, a core group that has a lot of power and has a lot of decision making input um, and and then slowly giving that away to to other people once they kind of become aligned, once they have a lot of context. Um, so that's kind of another one of the opinionated um, things. The other final opinion, though, and this is about Discord that you said before, and this is maybe the most interesting and exciting part of what we've built, because the rest of it's very kind of boring, uh, f foundational stuff, right? Think We think of like table stakes for starting an internet-based uh, entity. Um, the most interesting thing is like our opinions about Discord, I think, which is like, you know, we think Discord is great. It's been a great solution. Discord was built for gamers. It was not built for online communities. It was in particular not built for asynchronous chat. And so I think like it's been cool to see communities use it, but also at the same time, extremely damaging, both for individuals who have this like incredible information overload, um, but for communities who just like lose a lot of people, you know, and attrition is kind of the most important part of um, of building a community. You want to have really low churn. You want to have people coming in and sticking around. And um, products like Discord just are not built for that. They're built to be sort of these revolving doors because, yeah, it, like as soon as you're gone for like two hours, you lose all context. You've lost all meaning. Um, you know, that yeah, content is Discord. gone. Right. Yeah. And that content, and like our view is that that content is actually like the most valuable thing um, out there. Thankfully, Discord doesn't have these kind of weird terms where they say that they own your content or can use your content. They don't do that, thankfully. Um, but they still don't sort of respect the content to a degree that they uplift it or encourage it to be uh, read by people 
um, who are not there. Yeah. And so that's kind of the biggest design decision we've made with Lyco is like, um, we have a conversation space that has some small synchronous features, but most of it's meant for asynchronous communications where we've kind of merged like Discord, Twitter, and Reddit all into kind of like one very general, but very simple to use kind of interface. Do you have a sense of what types of businesses are going to be the first ones to thrive on Myco? Social businesses are definitely the most obvious ones. That's the ones we're building for kind of primarily as a target is, you know, we call them like social clubs and digital social clubs is kind of the best words we've found to describe what these are. Um, a lot of them right now exist either on Slack or on Discord or Telegram rooms. Um, but really, it's just like the pendulum swing of social media from really hyper private at the beginning of the Internet when it, things were first getting started to this like very public stage of the Internet where everyone's oh, so trying like to just pay like paid yeah. communities, you mean? Paid paid communities. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And, and and I mean, they might not be paid, but they'll almost always be curated um, in the sense of like who is able to produce the content and, and share, you know, share posts or things like that. Um, and really seeing those spaces as being like a, a new form of social media that is just like much higher quality information and relationship building. Um, and those we think like lend themselves really well to being businesses because like these days people are willing to pay for um, higher quality, you know, access to like information's relationships on the internet because there's just so much noise out there that, you know, just being able to distill that as a group is is really valuable. Gotcha. Okay. So you, you think in the in the first stage, the the main use case will be kind of like the people that are using Discord, like friends with benefits or the, the people that are basically, it's like paid exclusive access to some private community where the actual community itself is the value being provided uh, for some kind of fee. But now people, instead of paying a fee as a customer, you now basically pay a fee and you become a shareholder in an actual LLC that is with everyone else in the community. Exactly. Fascinating. And the, the Fascinating. key factor too that I'll add is like we we call these things CoS, C O. It's a simple word. And the reason behind it is that like what we're seeing in the world is that like companies, communities, collectives, and co-ops are all sort of like merging into each other. We see this a lot with like traditional companies, bureaucratic entities, you know, Fortune 500 companies now talking about community. We see communities then turning themselves into collectives, collectives turning themselves into co-ops. And so we think that like in 10 years, they'll all be the same thing. Um, and kind of looking even like sort of upstream of that in terms of like, okay, well, what kind of business is this? Um, you might answer that by thinking, okay, well, how do they make money, right? Do they charge membership fees? Um, or do they do other things? And again, what we're seeing from a lot of these these sort of newer social businesses is that they do any myriad of things. They might run events, they might have subscribers, they might have members, they might have merch stores, um, they might you know run events in person. There's sort of like no limit to what they can do, and that's kind of also the point of them being LLCs is they they really can do things like in the real world. Um, but we 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 try not to have too constrained of a view of like what types of businesses these are, because they can actually be any kind of businesses. Businesses, they're like culture businesses, um, and culture is such an ephemeral thing that um, you know you could attach a particular brand or a particular meme to any product and then be able to sell it. Um, you know, and I think that maybe is where the future of CPG goes. So the short answer is like we don't really know what kind of companies they'll be, but generally with a social basis seems to be important for for creating that culture. Wait, and what is CPG? Oh, well, CBG companies like, I don't know, like Unilever or um, Johnson Johnson that sell like toilet paper or soap or, you know, all these things like consumable goods. Um, people are really oh, okay. brand. They they have like when people have brand associations, they're much more likely to buy um, CPG products based on like marketing and brands rather than like the quality of the product itself. And so I personally gotcha. have this kind of developing thesis that a lot of um, powerful memes are then going to be used as marketing for CPG products that are just like white labeled soap. And you can have like Doge soap um, or I don't know, <laughs> so those types of things, seriously. And like people will buy them because memes yeah. and, and, and um, memes and uh, 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 brands are, are extremely powerful. Right. But I got right. That, that's fascinating. So I guess at the moment you couldn't, if you tried to build a DTC soap brand and call it Doge soap and, and use you know, doge imagery, I guess, could you do that? Or could you not at the moment? If you own the IP, you could, there's no reason you couldn't. Right. But who owns that IP right now? Like, does anyone? 
I mean, well, I think, I mean, I think Path bought one of the Doge images and then another right. Doge image is owned by Pleaser DAO. So, I mean, whether those will be untokenized, I don't know. And that, like, I don't know what that timeline looks like, but I can imagine certainly for a number of other memes that have been sold, there's no reason they couldn't be used for, for these types of things. The other example from like an NFT perspective that comes to mind is like Bored Ape Yacht Club. Um, they, like, I think a lot of people are working on this right now is, um, because like, I think if you own one, you can use the brand in certain, to a certain degree as part of anything. And so if that brand is, is valuable, um, there's no reason you couldn't put that brand on, on particular products and use that as part of, of, you know, marketing. Hmm. Fascinating. Okay. So much here. So I believe that you have some interesting opinions on the concept of web three social. Tell me a little bit about why you think Web3 Social is perhaps overhyped. Yeah, I, I, Web3 Social is something we've been hearing a lot about over the last, I would say, like six months. Um, it's a really interesting kind of idea that like we have the Internet and then the blockchains are like the ownership layer, but there's not enough good communication tools to go along with that. And I agree that like our communication tools suck and Discord isn't great. Um and I do think that there's room for like one small, I don't know how small, but maybe powerful, but one specific sort of type of Web3 social, which is just like being able to message a particular address. Um, I think that's a powerful use case. That's a real sort of like pain that I've personally felt and I'm sure others have felt. But beyond that, I think there's this like broad view of like put social on the blockchain, which just like doesn't make sense at a high level. And if you think about like the sort of like information architecture um, really doesn't make sense. You really don't need consensus on peer to peer messages. There's a number of different messaging protocols that are decentralized that have existed for many, many, many years and have nothing to do with blockchains, but are decentralized. Um, Matrix is one example. We use Matrix as part of Myco. Um, Scuttlebutt is another really cool project. Um, I think like Urbit, you and I <laughs> both like Ur Urbit, um, they have like communications and messaging as part of their protocol. So there's like these projects are out there and, and these things exist. But um, I see a lot of people talking about like this of sort of like big Web3 social or like, yeah, the blockchain of social that's going to replace Facebook. And I don't think it's going to be so clean. I think it's going to be uh, still a lot of just like fragmented networks that, you know, maybe the information's owned by users, which would be ideal. Um, but I don't think it's going to be like one central place where all of that lives. I'm it, at least to me at least right now, it's not clear what that looks like or why. Okay. okay. Fascinating. And, and what in particular did you learn from the, the blue, the blue sky white paper and this, this idea coming out of Twitter and Jack Dorsey around creating a, a more decentralized web? What did you take from that or what did you learn from that idea? Yeah, I mean, it was definitely a useful paper. We definitely read it. Like I read it when we were first founding Myco and we were trying to figure out what the alternatives were out there. And that Blue Sky paper is an excellent one. There's a number of others that like uh, compare social, um, different types of like social uh, protocols, social networking protocols. Um, so they did a lot of great work. Um, I think they're still probably early. And I think Twitter faces problems that, um, you know, like, private communities don't necessarily face. But um, the biggest one for us was just like helping uh, helping us understand and helping me understand like the trade-offs that come from these various different types of architectures. And I think that's probably the most important way to think about this stuff is that like there's always a trade-off between using uh, one type of protocol for, you know, m messaging or chat versus like another. And um, those trade-offs, what some of them make, you know, it harder to be a user and there's more like onboarding requirements um, but it might be faster or, you know, there's like, there's always different trade-offs and like as a founder, um, or, you know, even as a user, like your job is to figure out like what matters to me in this context. And so because social is such a, like we talk to people in so many different ways and so many different platforms, um, I struggle to think that there would be one single platform that somehow achieves all like sort of like the best solution for all of these different methods. You do think there will be or there won't be? I don't think there will be, no. I think it'll be like the so, internet okay. where like there's many websites that people use and each website ha does things their own way. And I think the same thing will be true for like social media protocols. Um, hopefully people can build aggregating tools that can read data from all these different protocols or to you know build a social graph for you or something like that. That would be cool. But I don't think it's like the data will be natively living all at like the same layer. 
I see. Okay. So you see a further fragmentation of different types of protocols that are built kind of fit to purpose for different trade for different uh, trade offs, depending on what um, a project is trying to optimize for. Okay, that's it. That's interesting. So, all right, well, say a little bit more about the current state of, of web 2.0 social media, I think I think that you're pretty bearish on things like Twitter. You know, it, uh, is Jack Dorsey going to make it or is he not going to make it? I don't know. I'm like, I'm still not sure on Jack Dorsey in particular. Twitter seems to be doing, <laughs> they're like trying to become more crypto savvy. First, they were like really maxi with the uh, lightning tips only. I don't know how many people have used that. Um, I think they're talking about adding this like Ethereum PFP verification, which I think is like a cool feature. I think it like doesn't actually solve the problem because I can still mint somebody else's art as an NFT and say that I own it. And it's like technically an NFT that is owned, but it's not the actual thing. So they haven't really solved like the core problem. Um, but I appreciate that they're trying and becoming more open to these other chains and like the activity in particular that's happening on these other chains, um, because I think that's like probably the most relevant. Um, but in terms of like at a high level web three, or web two social, like, I think that they are extremely evil companies. Um, and I believe that they have taken advantage of us to, like, I, 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 I don't like using the word digital slavery. Um, that's like very powerful language and I wanna be like cautious, but ultimately like they own all of our data and can use it in perpetuity for whatever purposes they please. And you imagine like a timeline where like Facebook goes under, uh, they have to liquidate their assets. One of those assets is all of our data and they sell it to a company which creates AI chatbots that sound like you, Justin. And they make a, you know, a Justin Murphy bot. You know what I mean? Like that's scary. That's like crazy. And yeah, the yeah. fact that we've given this stuff away for free um, to these companies is like, you know, we've been duped. And so I think people have talked about this before. This is not an original idea, but like, I think for me personally, like, and this is like for my co, right? Like when we think about all of the IP that these communities are creating, it should be owned by them. It's their IP. Um, and we should give them the tools to be able to own it. Um, rather than assuming it's like technically theirs, but we have perpetual usage rights. Um, that's just like a very exploitative business model. Um, so I generally try to avoid them, but I still use Twitter because like, yeah, I don't have an alternative. Right, for sure. So do you think that it, in 10 years or something like that, everyone has completely evacuated out of these big platforms and it's just like all private communities or or not? No, you no, You would no, not no. say I, it that radically or what? No, I do think there will always be a room for public uh public discourse and like that's for me right like that's what i use twitter for is to talk to people not in private spaces but to you know to still do that and i definitely don't see that going away i think people will spend less of their time than they have historically um, in those contexts but it's definitely i don't think it'll be zero um in terms of whether it'll be on like a twitter facebook google platform or if it'll be some other platform I, i'm i'm open i'm flexible but it's really hard to get that many people all in the same place. And when you're talking about a one to many platform where you want to have that many be as big as possible, um, overcoming those network effects is hard. Um, and I haven't seen anyone kind of like take a really solid stab at solving that problem. Maybe with like some really cool tokenomics, someone might be able to like launch a new Twitter where people get paid properly. I think people have tried, but um, it's just really hard to get the ball rolling, you know, the snowball big enough for it to be like a meaningful com like competitor. Right, like BitCloud. I don't know if you watched that kind of develop. Oh, don't even. I don't want to talk about <laughs> BitCloud. They, I, I feel like I have a, a permanent. What's your take? I have. I feel like I have a permanent right to talk smack about BitCloud because I was one of the like 15k people that they put on there uh, without permission, and so I feel like. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I feel like I kind of have that right, but yeah, I think that they are are like actually much more uh, exploitative even than these Web two companies. Um, because launching a token for somebody, a tradable asset on somebody else's behalf is an incredibly powerful and evil thing to do. You are selling somebody without their permission. Um, and so that is like a big no-no for me. I think BitCloud is definitely not going to make it. The founder of BitCloud, if you're listening, I'm really sorry, dude, you're not going to make it. Um, try something else. This is like, you know, and reading like his articles about it, he's like, oh, well, I never would have imagined that creators wouldn't have liked their 
images and identities being used and sold without their permission. And of course, one thinks like, hang on a minute, if you couldn't have foreseen this problem, why are you working on a product for this use case? Um, anyways, that's my bit club, right? Yeah, so that's great. Yeah. So I mean, there's this kind of mental model that comes out of VC where it's like you want to build a platform, super buzzy launch, you want to get as many people in as fast as possible, then people hear about it. And that brings more people. So it's like this, this aim to have hockey stick growth that be, locks in a network effect um, as soon as possible, basically like that, that's, that's a certain kind of mental model people have of what it takes to grow, to grow a network. And there is kind of a, some possibility that some kind of web three system or platform comes along that is able to kind of lock in a network effect and create a new kind of web three public sphere, perhaps possibly, but there is also this other mental model, which you were kind of alluding to before, I think, which is just greater and greater fragmentation, just more and more innovation on, on the edges. And you have this kind of like, um, expanding web of, of somewhat overlapping, but also discontinuous uh, private communities. And so it's like, there might be a future in which when you log on to the internet and you enter the public sphere, you, you're actually opening up like a few different communities. And maybe your your public sphere is different than my public sphere. And your public sphere is maybe like five different communities of interest to you. And it the total number of people in those communities might be, you know, 100,000 people, right? So a, a substantial, large, you know, public body but it's going to be a different public body than my public body. There's going to be a little bit of overlap, um, but also a, a lot of distance. And, and so I do think this is kind of one of the big cleavages in how people are thinking about the, the future of, of Web3. Um, and I guess my, my inclination is more towards that latter camp. Like I do think this kind of VC, this VC mental model of some one competitor is going to suck up all the attention, lock in a network effect like Facebook did or something like that. I, I guess I, I'm skeptical that that's going to happen in the world of Web three. I think you're. I personally think you're going to see more and more fragmentation, at least for quite some time. Maybe sometime down the line, there's some kind of reaggregation or or rebundling that that happens. But uh, am am I right to sense that that's kind of your intuition as well? So there's like kind of two things I'll say about this. One is that I think the the lightning in a bottle like VC model that you described is definitely becoming aged. And like we saw this, I think with Clubhouse, which grew very substantially, very quickly, and then, you know, has not been able to retain people. I think the bigger problem people are realizing is not like short term lightning in a bottle. It's like lightning in a bottle with a cork in it, right? Like, how do you keep people around? How do you keep people aligned? And this is like, you know, again, going back to Michael, like this is why we talk about churn and, you know, giving people ownership of their communities. That way they feel like co-owners. Um, those are kind of important qualities. And so, you know, will some protocol or some product be able to keep large numbers of people around? Um, I think it's possible. I think it's possible. Um, I don't think network effects like stop existing just because we're on Web3 world. Certainly in like a private community context, you know, where you only want to have 150 to 1,500 people in each of these communities. Like you, there's like a limit to how important that network effect becomes. But if you're talking about a one-to-many social space, you do still ultimately want as many eyes on your content as possible, right? And so um, I, I don't think that we're necessarily not going to see network effects play out. I just think like the the game, the the territory is shifting in such a way that like table stakes aren't what they used to be. You can't just like get people to download your thing or sign up or hear about your brand and then boom, you're done. Um, you need to give them something to stick around, whether that's like incentives or ownership or some other meaningful long-term, um, I don't want to say hook, but you know, some, some stickiness. Right. Well, let me ask you this as one way to get at the the question here is, when, when you think about what success looks like for Myco, you know, is your dream or is your vision the number of users that Facebook has? Probably not, right? Or is it? Maybe, I don't know. Uh, I mean, Facebook has a lot of users and I don't know if that many people right. need to launch <laughs> Co's. But I right. mean, for, for like our dream is to, you know, build a platform where as many people as possible can like launch businesses online, whether they're social businesses or not. And like our dream is to build a platform where um, people don't have to work full time, they can be working for like one or several of these company community collective entities. 
um, simultaneously and then can like own their own work and be free. Um, and so in an ideal world, like that is available to everybody. And when you think about the scale, like, yeah, that's pretty big. Um, do I think they're all going to use my code? Not necessarily. Um, but ultimately we do want to build a platform for lots of people. Um, and we care a lot about user ownership of our platform, hopefully to, to help um, keep people around and feel, like help them feel like invested and co-owners. Totally. But I, th I think like the way you answer that is, is indicative of exactly what I was get, kind of getting at, which is, you, I mean, you can have a massive, massive successful business with Myco with um, tons and tons of users. It could, it could be an absolute smash hit and incredibly uh, lucrative for you and for all the investors. And it would not even have the pretension of this kind of Facebook global domination. We're the community for all people. We are the public sphere now. And, and, and I think that's what's, that's, what's kind of most interesting to me, which is that there, there are going to be probably a lot of different competitors um, doing something similar as Myco, and and probably a handful of them can be mega successful because everything now is so fragmented, everything now is so niche. There's going to be all of this room for differentiation in this in this highly fragmented kind of like cultural market, and so that that's exactly why I'm I see a near future in which there are lots of uh, big you know revolutionary technological, social, commercial transformations. And nonetheless, at the big overarching public scale, um, it's not necessarily super visible what's taking over. You know what I'm saying? Like I think Facebook and Twitter and these kind of big, these big spaces could actually stick around for many decades as the face of, you know, the public sphere, but actually they're more and more evacuated of real energy and activity. And you know, in 10, 20 years, they're, they're still there and they are kind of the public, so to speak, but all of what's, all of what matters in society and, in, in, in who's like moving and shaking in, in public is being done in this like highly fragmented, uh, variegated, uh, set of, of, of chambers basically. Yeah. Yeah. And ultimately like, I don't, yeah, I definitely don't think it's a one, one winner take all kind of game. And I also think, you know, Growth for the sake of growth is the ideology of a cancer cell. I don't know who said that quote. That's not my quote. But you know what I mean? Like that's when you think of like a company like Facebook, they literally just tried to engineer themselves to grow as much as possible. And I know we certainly don't have that approach. And I think in Web3 in general, there's less of that kind of perspective of um, growth just for growth's sake. Right, right. And I, I do think that's indicative of, of something quite interesting. So, all right. So switching gears a little bit. I had on the podcast a couple of weeks ago, Path, and one of the things I was talking about with Path was this boom of generative art. And he came out with a pretty strong opinion that he thinks generative art, and for people listening, I just mean kind of procedurally generated or, or uh, programmatic art, people using computer programs to generate a large number of artistic outputs according to programmed uh, criteria. He thinks that this is overhyped and, and he thinks it's all o o overpriced. And his argument was basically that because it can be done with computer code, it's kind of become a commodity now. So, you know, and any, anyone who can whip up some Python can now make, you know, 10,000 instances of some, you know, geometrically modified, you know, geometric art or, you know, 10,000 profile pics of, you know, board apes or crypto punks or what have you. And so that was basically his argument that because it's it's so uh, available and, and so relatively simple to do it through computer code and computer code can be shared and copied, that it kind of cheapens the the whole point of art. And his hypothesis as, as an NFT collector and as someone, you know, watching the space and, and you know, uh, trading and all of that, his view is that the the most value in NFT art is going to remain with personal stories, uh, human artists who are experts and who have interesting stories and a uh, very personal human touch to their work, that that's going to be what retains value in the long run. I believe you're quite passionate about generative art. So what is the, what is the bull case for generative art and what does Path get wrong there? Yeah. So, okay, to start, I want to segment these things into two different buckets and I'll talk about each of them individually. Think of one as the PFPs, which is like the Bored Apes or, you know, all these other projects, there's a lot of them. And then we'll talk about um, the other ones, uh, the rest of the generative art. 
So with the PFPs, I'll just, and this is much faster. Um, I think they're like, you have to think of them more as like a social asset, like a community token or a social token more so than the art itself. Um, all so for people listening real quick, PFP yeah. is profile picture. Yeah. Yeah. And so basically gotcha. like when you're launching a community, you want to have like a focal point for your community that, you know, whether like all of these big communities and institutions of the past have a set of symbols or images or iconography that they, that is their focal point. That's like the, the bedrock of all culture is, is that. And so I think the PFP movement is really interesting because it allows for community creators to um, have a generative series, let's say 10,000 with sort of like different unique takes on the same thing, on the same symbology or the same values basically that are embedded into the art. And then individuals can find the ones that align most with them as individuals. And so they can like sort of don these PFPs both in the context of that community or outside of it um, and retain some degree of individuality, but at the same time signal their, their sort of membership within the collective. And I think like as a social... They're like, it's more of like a social mechanism and a social like um, a movement. Um, and that to me is like really interesting in its own right. And the way you value them has to be completely different than the way you value art because you're valuing a community, uh, a network of people. Um, and then you have to start thinking about things like, you know, what does this community do? Why do they gather? What are their values? Do they keep people around? Are they sticky? Um, all those types of questions. Um, so that's the PFPs, whether or not they're valuable or not, I don't know. I think these markets of course are like very hot right now. So I don't want to like say that they're undervalued or say that they're overvalued. I have no idea. Use your best judgment, but you know, that's like, that's, the, that's at least for me, how I evaluate the PFPs. Um, more interestingly, maybe is the generative art. And this is, I think more of what path was talking about. And I want to dive into it because like the lens through which I look at this and the context, I guess, is like, I've been going to art galleries since I was a really young kid. My mom used to bring me and my sister around to, you know, art galleries. And like, I've been consuming paintings, oil paintings, watercolor, whatever, for like a very large amount of time of my life. I've studied art history personally. It's like a big passion of mine. And so I think what I've been able to develop is a general like understanding of like uh, movements within art and, and how different mediums have affected art. And I think like, and that's like the thing people forget a lot about is like so much of the art, so much of different art movements is driven by the different mediums that they're able to use, whether it was like Renaissance painters finding new colors of blue that they could use in their paintings or, you know, those types of things. Um, but in particular, the best analogy I can make between generative art and um, like traditional art uh, movements of the past um, is like the, like prints because prints allowed an artist to, um, you know, create like a sort of scaled uh, to scale up their work to make many versions of the same work. Um, some of them being very unique. If you look at, um, you know, Japanese woodblock prints, some of them are like one of ones in the way that the colors are, you know, put in. They're like, they're still unique, but at the same time, they allow an artist to scale up their, their work and to like do more interesting things at like a bigger scale. If you think about generative art, this is kind of taken to a next level where like, yeah, at the click of a button, almost they can, they can generate, you know, 10,000 or a hundred thousand or a hundred million of these works. Um, but if you think about, and if you look at how the really, the best generative art is created, it is this kind of dance between an artist and an algorithm and they're creating the algorithm, but then they also don't control all of it. There's an element of randomness, um, you know, with the seeds, uh, the seed of, of uh, you know, when these things are purchased, they add an element of uniqueness uh, at the time of purchase. Um, so even the artist doesn't sometimes know what's going to happen. Um, but I think it like is this new medium for artists to express themselves in tandem with algorithms. And I think this is like when we think about what art is going to be in the next hundred years, I think this is where it will go is that it sure, of course, like one of one, you know, works are still going to be incredibly valuable and are really interesting. But I think a lot of the, the activity will be uh, individuals working with or alongside algorithms to create these, these really, really interesting works. And so the final point I'll make is like, I do think a lot of the generative art is, I don't want to say crap. Like I don't, I don't ever want to tell somebody their art is crap or if people like certain pieces, I like, I don't find them valuable or meaningful um, because they don't make me feel anything. But there's certain like um, uh, generative art pieces that make me feel more than like non-generative art. And I can tell that like the artist has actually embedded a lot of 
um, a, a feeling into this work, despite the fact that technically speaking, it was finished by, uh, uh, you know, an AI or, or uh, you know, an algorithm. Um, so that's like my general bull case on generative AF NFTs. I do think a lot of them are probably still worthless or, you know, maybe worth too much. I don't know. Um, but like, I do think if we look into the next hundred years, like a lot of art will be generative and this is a big movement. And therefore the early pieces that are setting trends within that movement or, um, that are, that are memorable, that are, that are, um, unique, that stick out, that do something new that others haven't necessarily done. Um, I think that that will always be valuable. That's sort of the way that art movements work. Um, and so that's kind of how I evaluate them. Yeah, that's fascinating. That's very well argued and interesting. It is almost reminiscent of the debate between these newfangled internet businesses versus the old mom and pop shops. You know, it's like when when Amazon first comes around, how many people said, oh, yeah, but, you know, I just would rather buy my books from from the local mom and pop. It just feels nicer. Right. Um, and you know, I, I think there's there's a real truth to that. I mean, there is there's something deep in in that that I think we all understand and feel and appreciate. But also, it wasn't going to stop Amazon, <laughs> right? And uh, you know, now and nowadays, even the most localist book lover uh, probably orders at least some of their books on Amazon. So I wonder, I wonder if it's the same in a way. In that, what you're kind of arguing is that artists will just have to become more technically sophisticated or collaborate with people who are more technically technically sophisticated and that this is ultimately on net an improvement of of the art that this is an elevation of the art uh just like to be a businessman today requires you to be a technologist maybe to be an artist today now requires you to be a technologist is that sensible i do th i mean i think that's true for a lot of i mean it depends on the type of artist like there's still some artists who paint in oil on one of one canvases and i love their work and i collect their work and i think artists should choose the medium that speaks to them the best but they're at the same time like people you know if you're thinking about like uh photographers who are selling their finished pieces that is technically generative art they've um almost all of them have you know, put their images through various algorithms uh, via things like Lightroom or Photoshop or whatever to edit their photos or to touch them up or to finish them in, in a certain way that is suitable for their, uh, the impression they want to leave the audience. So there is still like a human touch there, but they're using algorithms to, um, to sort of enhance their power over their work. Um, and that's uh, maybe the better way to think, because I don't think generative art is like the Amazon of art necessarily. I do think there's still a very real like human touch there. Um, but at the same time, yeah, like it, thinking about it as the ability to scale and and just like the ability to do things you couldn't do manually um, and to like codify a variety of alternatives and then let the algorithm play within that space and like honestly see what randomness comes up with because sometimes randomness comes up with cooler things than the human mind even could have and that is like its own interesting thought experiment <laughs> yeah that's great that's great do you see any other big opportunities in this kind of web 3 space or actually what you've called web 2.5 which i think is actually pretty funny and 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 a, a useful a useful corrective this this kind of middle zone between the current web 2 and this web 3 where we're headed do you see other big opportunities in web 2.5 that if you weren't let's say building myco would be like oh man this is this is like a big thing someone has to solve this or someone should be working on this it, just off the top of your head is there anything that stands out to you that you want to kind of shout out or or talk a little bit about i mean i'll be very honest i couldn't be building anything that's not myco there's like it's too uh core to me for me to even be able like i don't even know what those alternatives sure. would be and I've, I've never thought about it but the what i will say what came to my mind as like a pressing problem that somebody needs to solve um is the one i highlighted earlier about the nfts and validating and being able to copy work um that's a really really hard problem i don't know how to solve that problem um but like there does need to like it's a big pain point right of like is this work of art real or valid and and being able to like sort of do some level of validation over a particular image or um, piece of media or, you know, what have you. Um, I think that's super important. And as people start to think more about IP rights and treasuring their IP rights and not thinking about their media as um, things they give away for free, um, I think that's going to become more important is like, how do you identify whether a piece of IP is, is 
somebody's or whether the one that they own is the real one. Um, it's a really hard problem, but we're solving. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe just a couple more questions, bring it back to, to Myco and, you know, the near future of, of what you're building and, and what, what we can expect from Myco, because I, I do find it very interesting and compelling. Is the idea that a Myco also comes equipped with the IP infrastructure as well? Because you've been mentioning IP a lot. What is Myco's take on IP? Like, is it like anything created within the the Myco or the Co within the Co is like community IP? Or w- how do you think about that? And and how are you kind of instantiating that technologically? Yeah. So for, like we use legal contracts as part of these codes. They're like technically LLCs and there's all these, you know, legal contracts, even a terms of service with us. Right. And so um, we we're still fleshing out. I don't want to like make any promises, but we're trying to figure out what this middle ground is in such a way that, yeah, basically what you described that the community can co-own or the company, I guess, that that is the community, the co um, owns all of that IP that is created within itself. Um, and the, the tricky line there is like, well, what about IP that was like already owned by somebody before it was shared within that context? Um, and that's like where the, where things get tricky. Um, but ultimately, yeah, that's the goal is that like, you know, it, when you think about information sharing communities, right, like where they're generating insights and they're um, analyzing things and, and creating really sort of valuable um, reports, let's say, off of data, like that is IP, that is valuable IP. Um, and so like thinking about it like that, um, is like sort of one example. And yeah, we want the co's to be able to own them, to be able to monetize them, to, to even recognize that they're valuable. Right. And, and, and like, think of them as this like asset that is on their books. Um, I know a lot of people talk about like their Twitter accounts being valuable because they've tweeted so much that it's like a book's worth of tweets. Right. And they're like, this is my IP and they do think of it as valuable, but of course, you know, Twitter co-owns it with you. Um, but I think that perspective for communities, like when you think about communities that might exist for five years, 10 years, 50 years, um, all of that data, all of that history, all of those connections, all the things that have happened are, are is it's really valuable data and it should be owned by and only monetizable by that co. Yeah, that's a really interesting example you bring up about the accumulated value of a, let's say a Twitter account, because that brings it a little bit more into my wheelhouse, which is, you know, writing and 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 that side of things and so it is kind of interesting to think about like the various forums that people participate in it's like if you write a really good forum post in in some community forum you know that that value is kind of just being pissed away which is unfortunate right and so i guess the idea is that in a mic in a in a co within my co it's kind of intrinsically being contained and and retained and 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 that that value is is um a, a really good piece of written work that you post in your in your co is a creative to it's a it's a creative to the company that you're a member of right and so in a way i mean i wonder if you could imagine a a, a co on my co that's straight up just like a writing collective basically where it's like um everyone is generating high value insights and everyone owns a share in the company and people want to get into that community because they want to access the the valuable insights. It's like, it, am I thinking along the right lines for for how you're envisioning the the usage? Yeah, absolutely. And the only other element I'll add is that you know you could imagine these co's being able to uh, produce work for subscribers that aren't uh, members that don't contribute necessarily to the creation, but who pay to consume it because it it is valuable, right? And so um, that's like kind of another lens to think about it. But, and then the final piece is like, yeah, we also like, because it's valuable because it's yours, like we want you to, uh, recognize those valuable nuggets. Right. And like, I'm thinking of in my head of like old tweets that were just like real gems that are like really interesting to look back on and then being able to analyze them in the, from the future perspective and be like, oh, well, here's what was actually happening here. And this is a sort of evidence of this cultural movement or this thing. Right. Um, or, you know, I imagine going back to like, early social clubs. If you think about, um, I don't know, Benjamin Franklin with his like Junto club, um, being able to like listen to those transcripts of those conversations. And could you imagine like what Benjamin Franklin and his peers would have been talking about in those groups? It would have been probably extremely valuable and like, and valuable in a way that like people would buy books of that stuff, you know? And so I don't know like what this looks like in its end form, end state, end form, but 
like ultimately that's like we that's i think a mindset that we want to uh, approach you know ip and user data and user media with all right very cool very cool well this was a super interesting discussion i really like your perspective and i, I like the ideas you bring to the table kind of underwriting you, what you're building with myco so thank you very much for you know sharing your time and sharing uh your, your attention with us and is there anything before I let you go? Is there anything? Is there anything you know I can do for you, or that my audience could could do for you, or Myco, or any, anything you wanted to uh, you know shout out at all? If you're listening to this and you think you might want to use Myco, we are always like right now, based on the way that we're building Myco, we want 50% of the company really to be co-owned by our users, our early co's, our partners, um, and because we want to reward those people who are there early on. Um, maybe a little bit more handsomely than people who join later, right? Taking into account network effects. Um, we're looking for those early partners. And so if you're listening to this, we're still very early. We're still like in beta. Uh, but if you're listening to this and you think you might want to launch a co or join a co or, you know, learn more, um, mark at myco.space is my email. Um, please send me an email. I always love to chat and um, just jam on this stuff. All right. Awesome. And yeah, people can go check out myco at myco.space myco and get on the, uh, exactly. the list to be a beta user. Exactly. And uh, yeah, Mark, just once again, want to thank you. I really enjoyed this. It was uh, very insightful and uh, really gave us a lot of food for thought um, on, you know, what to expect next in this, in this wild world of uh, what you call web 2.5. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a, it's been a real pleasure. Hey, thank you so much for listening to the podcast. You made it all the way to the very end, so you must really like the show. In that case, I would be super grateful if you'd be so kind to leave a review on Apple Podcasts. All you have to do is go to otherlife.co slash review. That's otherlife.co forward slash review. And it'll send you an Apple Podcasts. Just leave a review. You can be honest. Tell me what you really think. I'd really appreciate it because it'll help other people find the show, and I'm really trying to grow out the podcast. So thanks for listening, and thank you for leaving a review. I really appreciate it.